I discover things in the poems when I read them that I didn't know I knew. Yeah, yeah. How does that happen? You can um, see that your brain waves change when you get in a more peaceful and trance-like state. And when you're writing, and I, I imagine that when you're creating any kind of artwork, uh, your brain waves change enormously, and you're clicking on all cylinders for that short period of time. But we, most of us can't sustain that for a long period of time. So you finish the poem, then you come back to your daily self, and then you read the poem and you say, oh, I didn't know I knew that, because you were working at high speed. Um, and working with both your rational mind and your emotions and your spirit, not just your rational mind alone. So years later, you can learn something from your own? Yes, I'm still learning from these poems. I really am. Wise, funny, down-to-earth, insightful, Irene McKinney is West Virginia's Poet Laureate. She has a habit of saying things people want to remember. National critics praise her four books of poetry. As one reviewer said, her poems cut beneath the skin, tunnel into the blood, and capture the soul of a place and its people. Growing up on a working mountain farm in Barber County, she dug potatoes, carried coal, tended fires, fed the animals, rambled the fields, and read everything she could get her hands on. Later, she got a PhD and taught poetry in many parts of the United States. Then, in her 40s, she came home, built a house on the family farm, and started teaching West Virginia students. Now, in her 60s, she's working on a memoir. It's not just a memoir of me. In fact, it's not so much a memoir of me. It's a memoir of a place, because it seems to me that I am formed by this place. And by talking about this region and the people I grew up around and the family and the acquaintances, that's the best way for me to say who I am. Your poetry is full of references to secrets buried in common objects and things that we see every day. And yeah, I, I do think a lot about secrets because this also connects in my mind with the idea of humility in the face of life. Um, I think that probably a lot of writers are questioners and they want to leave these questions open-ended because I know I don't know. <laughs> you know, the, the, um, There's so much more unknown and I like to keep that in mind. It keeps things in proper perspective. Irene McKinney grew up in a fast vanishing culture, a mountain farming community of about 25 families who helped each other thresh grain, shuck corn, butcher hogs, you help me, I help you. Their social life centered around the Talbot Road Methodist Church and the small community building they built themselves for potlucks, fairs, community entertainment, two miles from Irene's home. I was living in Salt Lake City and my dad was a trustee of the church and he wrote to me and said, this is the very best time for you to buy a gravesite because the rates will never be lower. You can get it for $35. It's a real bargain. And at the time I thought, I don't care anything about that, but to please him, I'll do that. So I bought it. And later on, it became a kind of icon to me of permanence in the middle of impermanence. Visiting my gravesite, Talbot Churchyard, West Virginia. Maybe because I was married and felt secure and dead at once, I listened to my father's urgings about the future and bought this double plot on the hillside with a view of the bare white church, the old elms, and the creek below. I plan now to use both plots luxuriantly spreading out in the middle of a big double bed. But no, finally, my burial has nothing to do with marriage. This lying here in these same bones will be as real as anything I can imagine for who I'll be then. As real as anything undergone, going back and forth to the world out there. And here to this one spot on the earth I really know, 
Once I came in fast and low in a little plane. And when I looked down at the church, the trees I felt with my hands, the neighbors' houses and the family farm, and I saw how tiny what I loved or knew was. It was like my children going on with their plans and griefs at a distance and nothing I could do about it. But I wanted to reach down and pat it while letting it know I wouldn't interfere for the world. The world being everything this isn't, this unknown, buried in the known. On the surface, that means you think about you're going to be buried in the ground. And you don't really know who you truly are or what's going to happen. But you know that piece of land. That piece of land is known. I can look at it. There it is. I am still unknown. And so the unknown will be buried in the known. Well, we're sitting here and I can look out your window and see the place where you grew up. Yeah. You can do that every yeah. day. My dad gave me this 30 acres on this edge of the farm. And so I'm right here at the edge of the woods. But it's a good place for me because I can look across there and see the home place and the barn. Uh, but at some distance. It gives me a distance on it. This is my place and that's the place I came from. How long has your family worked this land? Um, they came here from Albemarle County in Virginia in 1840. They just gathered up all their possessions and got in a wagon and came across the mountain and settled over uh, about 10 miles from here um, in a little cabin and it started building the home place. And it took them about eight years to finish the home place and then they moved into it. And after that, nobody but my family lived there. So it's been about 150 years yes. and about that. Imagine them trying to farm this place. When I can't believe it. I think about, you know, what choices they made. Charlottesville is such a settled and civilized place, and it was even then. And for them to pick up and say, let's just go across the mountains to this unknown place and start homesteading. After her divorce and after her children were on their own, Irene McKinney was teaching college in New York. Her national reputation as a poet was growing. Her college gave her a six-month sabbatical to finish two poetry books. She came back home to write. And I thought of it as something very temporary. I thought as soon as I finish these books, I'll get back into what I was doing before. But it, it gradually took over because of the comparative peacefulness of it. She thought she was coming home for a short time, but she stayed. It's a choice that I didn't know I was making. Something inside me was smarter than my rational mind. Something down deep knew better. Viridian Days. I was an ordinary woman and so I appeared eccentric, collecting gigaws of porcelain and cobalt blue, mincing deer meat for the cat. I was unhooked from matrimony, and so I rose up like a hot air balloon and drifted down eventually into the countryside. Not shoveled New England, nor the grandeur of the West, but disheveled West Virginia, where the hills are flung around like old green handkerchiefs and the chessy rumbles along, shaking the smooth, clean skin of the river. If I wanted to glue magazine pictures to an entire wall or walk around nude, I did so, having no standard to maintain and no small children to be humiliated by my defection. I spent years puttering around in a green bathrobe, smelling of coffee, perfume, sweat, incense, and female effluvia. Why not? That was my motto. I collected books like some women collect green stamps, but I read them all down to the finest print, the solid cubes of footnotes. 
Since no one was there, nobody stopped me. Raspberry vines slash at the Toyota's sides as I come in. Flocks of starlings, gross beaks, morning doves lift the air around the house. Fragments of turkey bones the dog chewed on. A swarm of ladybugs made into a red enameled necklace. Holes of black sunflower seeds piled on the porch boards. Locust, hickory, sweet gum trees. Absolute silence stricken by crow calls. Copper pans, eight strands of seed beads, dolphin earrings. I climb over the fence at the edge of the woods, back and forth over it several times a day, gathering ferns, then digging in the parsley, shaggy, pungent, green. There's a contradiction at the heart of this poem. It's about how not having anything can be a great gift. It's about how uh, being alone can be a great gift. Um, it's about how isolation can help you connect. So there's a kind of a paradox at the heart of it, I think, about finding gifts in unexpected places. You step out your door here and you see a hundred things, hundred small things that yeah. you could write about. Yeah, yeah. the plant life, the trees. I'm, I'm very, very uh, fond of the trees in an odd sort of way. I like to go out for walks and just kind of look at the trees and what I feel is, um, gee, you, you trees do a good job at what you do. <laughs> You're really good at it. <laughs> I admire you. <laughs> It also strikes me that you connect with small things in nature, birds, plants. Yes, in a way that you cannot if you're busy with the human world. I think that seeing the world as full of all kinds of things, plants, animals, cloud systems, weather systems, and human beings, gives us a proper humility. A humility that is very hard to come by if you spend all your time in the completely human world. Because in the completely human world, we tend to think we are all there is. And this is so wrong and has caused so much trouble in our lives, that belief that we're everything, that we're the center of everything. Atavistic. I wanted to walk without clothing in the woods beside the creek and to come to the barn at night and sleep beside the horses curled in the smell and scratch of hay with the bitch and pups. The life of the house was flat, filled with monotonous talking, passing to and fro among the rooms. And for what? My mother hated animals, the way they ate the food and dirtied the floor. They were her enemies. She fought their right to be there and would have wiped them off the earth if she could have. If a cat or dog came too close to the back door, she threw scalding water on it and was righteous in her anger, shouting that they were not human and didn't feel real pain. If we must choose sides, I said as a child, I take the side of the animals. After I talked with a lot of farm wives later, I understood it better. If you're very poor and you have animals who are not earning their way on the farm, I, there's a certain logic to that. You know, why would you feed animals that did nothing for you? Um, you feed the cattle because you get return. You feed the horses because you use them to work the fields. And when you were growing up here in a, in a very close farming community, uh, uh, people were counting pennies. Sure, absolutely, everybody was. We didn't really have any cash. Um, we raised all our own food and we had our own fuel. And my dad had a little uh, coal mine down here under the hill just for his use, for the household use. You know, we had everything we needed, but we didn't have cash. 
And if you wanted cash, you had to um, have a pretty elaborate plan. My older brother trapped animals and sold hides. And he also dug ginseng and dried that and sold it. Also golden root or gold seal. A lot of people around here did that. Um, if I wanted just a little cash, I would go and um, gather two dozen eggs and take them with, with me on the school bus. And when we stopped at the store a few miles down the road, I would take the eggs in and trade them for candy bars. <laughs> that was my cash. <laughs> One of the things I've been thinking a lot about is I no longer care to come out sounding wonderful in a poem, come out smelling like a rose. I think there's always that impulse in a poet's writing, but I'm not trying to be wonderful. I'm not trying to be anything more than I am, which is an ordinary person with ordinary desires and ambitions. So it's very precious to me that I be just as truthful as I can about the unpleasant things in my life the times when I was depressed and confused and going in the wrong direction. I'm trying to use the poem as a place where I can see clearly. Stained. I'm stained with the iron red water from the mines and I'm stained with tobacco and red wine and the rest of perpetual loss. Near maybe West Virginia, I pulled off the narrow road one morning on my way to work as a substitute teacher. I wanted to stand there a while to see how bad it was. My shuddering in 10 degree weather on my way to something that couldn't possibly matter. I had quit smoking and I felt like a squirrel about to be shot looking around in a frenzy. There was a squirrel there, not afraid at all turning a hickory nut in its hands and ignoring me. I must have looked like what I was, a woman who had lost her bearings and refused to admit it. It was another day in my history of posthumous days, another day when nobody touched my body. That's such a straightforward, unvarnished look. I, I want very much to work against the stereotype of living in the mountains and living in Appalachia as some kind of paradise on earth. We all know that isn't true. It's rough. These choices are rough. And uh, there's a lot of isolation, a lot of being cut off from the larger world at various times, a lot of limited job opportunities, a lot of lowered economic expectations. And to me, it is as equally important to look at that in poems as it is to look at the positive side. The positive side is nothing without that under, underlayment of uh, the gritty parts of life. And loneliness is part of that. Isolation and loneliness is part of that. Well, you got all these books in here. You, you, I mean, loneliness for people maybe, but certainly not loneliness for voices. No, and they fill in a great, great deal. Yeah, I can walk around here and say, what, who would I like to read today? And this has been a, an enormous comfort to me. Have you read all these books? Yes, I actually have many of them over several times. I think we're surrounded by masks, also. Yes, I love these masks. I, I think about how. As human beings, we have these layers of reality. There are certain layers that I would show to you or to show to somebody else or show to a family member. And it's like there's no end to the masks. You know, we take off one and there's another one under that. And I love traditional cultures that acknowledge that and are willing to actually hold that mask up in front of their face and be that other person for a while or show that aspect of themselves and then take it off, you know, and then go back to their ordinary life. Next time they do a ritual, they pick it up again. Uh, the, the Irish poet, uh, William Butler Yeats, talked a lot about masks and archetypes and personas and so on. And I think that many, many poets do that. I mean, you put on a mask, a uh, certain kind of mask, that's a part of you when you start to write a poem and you speak out of that mask. You're saying that this place helps you feel more connected to people. There's a lot, at the same time, there's a lot more disconnection in the world. 
Yes, there absolutely is. It just grows by the week. Um, now and then I have a moment of realization. I remember during the uh, flap about Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky, like a lot of Americans, I stayed glued to the TV for two or three days. And then one day, I just looked at uh, her and him, and I thought, I don't know those people. You know, I know my cousin Bert, who lives next door. I've seen him ever since I grew up. I know him. But I, I'll never meet Monica Lewinsky. I don't want to meet Monica Lewinsky. I don't care anything about her. She's unreal to me. She's an image on television. And when you realize that, you suddenly see that these people that you deal with on a daily basis are really at the heart of your life. This other stuff is um, image and frou-frou and a little bit of information, not a lot of information. But when, when you can get your mind around the fact that you don't really know those people that you think you know, then it throws you back to the people you really do know, the ones you're going to have to depend on in hard times. That small community of people, this is a great comfort to know where you are, to be able to place yourself physically within a community. Well, people all over this country are looking for that kind of readiness. Yes. And we have it, and we don't always recognize what we've got. Yes. There's a mixture of envy and resentment about mountain culture. Because on the one hand, people want to have a sense of permanence and home. And down deep, they know that probably they aren't going to exactly get it. Because, you know, they've opted for other choices in their lives. And American life pushes you in that direction. It moves you uh, around the country very often for job opportunities. Um, it creates a feeling of floatingness and impermanence. It's just part of our culture. And so people have this residual longing. They want to step back in history. And since we're a consumer society, there's a little suspicion that you should be able to buy it in some way, that you can come back and buy a load of quilts or go to a dulcimer workshop or something so that you can actually purchase a little piece of that. And I wish that people could somehow recover that sense of community, um, but it's as much sometimes a trap as it is um, a haven for the people who live in it. It's important to remember both those sides. People are always coming up to you, I have a feeling, after you read and saying, I like that poem, did that really happen? I mean, is that true? Yes, yes, this is a basic question for non-writers because it's only natural that you would assume if something really resonates with you, you hear something, and you're moved by it, and you think, that's honest, that's authentic, it must be true. And you may have true details. In yes, it. all my poems have true details in them. But I think most artists, not just writers, most artists mix up their uh, sources. So you may be writing about your uncle, and you're actually writing about three uncles, one with this characteristic, one with that, and one with another. It's never just straight out of your experience in, onto the page. You have to undergo a sort of period of applying heat and passion to it and changing things around. And then it comes out on the other side and it's finished, hopefully. None of this is personal, not the way you'd think. The moon keeps on traveling, and I can see it from my balcony each night, and each night different, but it's not my own, not like we want things to be our very own. But it sways me, nevertheless, and stands in for certain losses and gains, and for even that much I'm grateful. I stand at the back door and stare. Now you're contending with bone cancer. Yes. What are you seeing now that you didn't see before? A tremendous sense of human connection. Because I think, like uh, so many writers, I spend a lot of time alone. And it was very hard for me to spend um, a lot of social time with people. I always limited it because I was always thinking of the next thing I wanted to write. And I wanted to get alone to do that. And I don't think that I properly appreciated 
the centrality of human connection. When you feel your heart warming up to another human being and actually feel your heart expanding. You're sitting there talking to somebody and you can feel this warmth around your heart and you know that's healing. It's bound to be healing. That's, that's the big change in my life. Ready. I remember a Sunday with the smell of food drifting out the door of the cavernous kitchen, and my serious teenage sister and her girlfriends, Jean and Mary Bell, standing on the bank above the dirt road in their white sandals, ready to walk to the country church a mile away, and ready to return to the fried chicken, green beans and ham, and fresh bread spread on the table. The sun was bright and their clean cotton dresses swirled as they turned. I was a witness to it, and I assure you that it's true. I remember this 30 years later as I got up from the hospital bed, favoring my right side where something else had been removed. Pushing a cart that held practically all of my vital fluids, I made my way down the hall because I wanted to stand up for no reason. I had no future plans, and I would never found a movement nor understand the simplest equation. I would never chair the Department of Importance. Nevertheless, I was about to embark on a third life, having used up the first two, as I would this one. So I shoved the IV with its sugars and tubes steadily ahead of me, passing a frail man in a hospital gown pushing his cart from the other direction. Because I was determined to pull this together, hooking this lifeline into the next one. Do you remember what Minnie Pearl always said at the end of her? I'm done now. <laughs> I'm through talking. She says, I'm through talking now. <laughs> this has been a production of West Virginia Public Broadcasting.